Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, so I work at Miele right now, but most of the work I'm presenting today has been done back in Zurich at the Institute of Neuroinformatics. And I'm going to be speaking about something that might seem a little bit exotic to many of you. And I'm going to try to make that seem a little less exotic and a bit more natural. Um, to illustrate my point, I brought a little live demo of an analog neural network. It's right here, my brain. And the interesting thing about this system is that essentially no two neurons behave exactly the same. They're all a little bit different. They're noisy, they're imprecise, and quite unreliable. Nevertheless, the system is able to kind of at least make me stand here and say some of these random things. So it seems to be working to some extent. And um, so, yeah, why, why, why is it interesting to think about analog electronics in, in the context of deep networks? So as I guess most of us are here because we're interested in building better and more powerful systems for machine learning to be able to, to solve more interesting problems. And this is a type of hardware we, we use today to solve these problems. State-of-the-art GPU, um, completely digital. And in fact, essentially all computing infrastructure that's around today is digital. And that's for a reason, and the reason is predictability and reliability. So we, when we fabricate such a device, we want to make sure that it performs exactly the same every time we fabricate it. That we want to make sure we know exactly what's happening. And this makes perfect sense in, in a conventional computing paradigm where the, the execution of a program depends on the exact sequence of um, the execution of precise operations. But maybe it's a little less important in the context of very high dimensional function approximators such as neural networks where, for example, um, if you have millions of dimensions, maybe it doesn't really matter if one dimension screws up a little bit. And this reliability comes at a cost. So using digital representations, digital logic means um, essentially quite complex circuits which means billions of transistors in these devices which have to be run at high speeds and consume substantial amounts of power. So for instance, we cannot fit this GPU into, into this phone as a consequence. And maybe it's worth thinking about other approaches which, um, such as analog electronics, but I, don't, I really don't want to point fingers at people doing digital here. It's just one alternative way that might be worth thinking about. It turns out that in an analog world where things are represented in terms of currents or voltages, things might become substantially simpler. So for instance, this rectification or this nonlinearity can be implemented using just one single transistor. And if things are represented in terms of currents, the summation here can, can be implemented. Um, it essentially comes for free. Summation of currents means just connecting wires. And similarly, the multiplication by a constant can be implemented using just two transistors in the, in the simplest case. And so this compactness of, of these circuits means we can essentially lay out the full, full network in hardware, full parallelism. Um, so we can do this. We can, we can fabricate such a device based on analog circuits and maybe fabricate this chip and then measure it. And then we would see something like this. So this is the, these are the responses of different neurons on, on this device. Um, the response in terms of output current as a function of the input current. And it's obvious that different neurons don't do exactly the same. They, they all respond slightly differently. And this is due to the imperfection that's inherent to any fabrication <laughs> process. So since we're directly using the physical properties of the silicon here, like slight um, deviations in the, in the local um, properties of the silicon do have an effect on the computation. The good news is that in a neural network, this doesn't really matter. Since we are um, optimizing the system for a particular task through, through a training procedure, we can simply take into account these measured character device characteristics and use them as constraints in the, in the training, in the optimization procedure. In other words, we can rather than using a homogeneous um, neuron representation as a model during training, we can use individual um, transfer characters, characteristics, for instance, or we can also apply this to the weighting and so on. So we can do this, and um, by doing so, we, we obtain a set of parameters 
for a particular device that has been measured. And in that way, we can still implement the desired function functionality of, on, on this device. So this can be done. And um, here's a simulation of such a system, a simple network with one hidden layer where the input MNIST is provided in terms of currents. And on the, on the top, you see the activations or the states of, of the hidden units. And as the input image is switched, it takes some time for the for these units to settle to a new state, and this is essentially the time it takes for the for the for the electric charges to flow from one device to another. And after some time, the the correct or the desired output can be read out as the index of the maximally active unit in the output layer. In this case, it takes around several microseconds to compute this output, and there's no time stepping. Everything is done in continuous time, and. This leads to quite, can, can lead to quite efficient um, implementations. So in terms of efficiency, even though we use this um, very antique um, fabrication process, 180 nanometers was state of the art about two decades ago, we, we get efficiency numbers that are comparable to what people see in, in state of the art digital, digital systems. So, um, we also built a small, a tiny prototype chip to just show that it, this works in real life. Um, classifying the iris data set here is not, not very impressive, but it, it, it does work. And I think I'm kind of running out of time. So let me, let me quickly com conclude that um, analog electronics can help in terms of efficiency, compactness, and maybe also speed. And this is due to, to the fact that we can, in this way, reduce <coughs> the circuits to, to their essence, essentially, and sort of use the bare silicon to, to carry out the computation. And this is possible we can, because we can just use the resulting <coughs> imperfections as constraints in the training to still obtain a system that, that performs well on a given task. Um, so the overall point I'm, I'm trying to make is that maybe digital representations kind of add a layer on top of silicon that's not really necessary in these scenarios. And that's all I wanted to say. Come to our poster number 42 in the second session. Thank you so much.